Chapter 4 A little bird told me that tomorrow is someone's birthday, Miss Rosemary said with a quick, corner-of-the-eye glance from Gypsy to me as she cut a slab of meatloaf and placed it onto Grandpa Bomba's plate. The preacher's wife smiled down at the meatloaf with its big, unfortunate, wormy onions and thin, dry layer of ketchup. I watched the knife as she cut another slice and pretended that I hadn't heard her say anything. Sitting at that table just then was like sitting in a pressure cooker, thanks to fish. The air in the room went hot and taut. Only Gypsy reacted to Miss Rosemary because she was three years old and didn't know yet what the rest of us Beaumonts knew about secrets, needing them, having them, or keeping them. Gypsy clapped her toddler hands together, eyes bright and eager in anticipation of balloons and sugar frosting. I thought, Miss Rosemary continued, apparently unaware of the tension and the breeze. I thought that a birthday party might help cheer everyone up a bit. She looked around the table from one face to the next. Fish stared at the salt and pepper shakers in front of him, the good crystal ones that Mama never used but kept up high in the don't touch or else cupboard. I could see him trying to get a good, tight grip on his savvy. It was straining him, though, and he was starting to sweat, looking pained and gray and miserable. I don't have to be there, do I, mother? Bobby said, jamming a fork full of meatloaf into her mouth and rolling her eyes like she was possessed or was having some kind of fit. Part of me hoped her eyes would get stuck that way, just as people would always said could happen. Yes, Roberta, we'll all be there. Yes, Roberta, we'll all be there, Bobby mimicked around her mouth, m mouthful of meatloaf in a frighteningly perfect imitation of her mother's voice. That's enough, Roberta. Miss Rosemary shot Bobby a look of sheer ice that thawed into an apologetic smile as she looked back at me. Bobby slouched down in her chair. We'll have the party at the church, of course, the preacher's wife continued, as though she'd not been interrupted. It's rather short notice, but we can still invite all of your church friends, Mibs, as well as anyone from school you'd like to ask. I don't have any friends, Miss Rosemary, I said, hoping that the truth might end the conversation. I'm your friend, Mibs, Will Jr. said with earnest. I looked across the table at him in his buttoned-up shirt. Will grinned at me then, smiling, looking and he looked different somehow, or relaxed, none too sure about how I was feeling toward Will Jr. just then. I didn't smile back, but I didn't scowl either. Nonsense, Miss Rosemary continued, as though Will had said nothing. I'll show you. I'll get on the phone this evening and cook you up a fine party for tomorrow. Don't you worry, Mibs. I have connections. Miss Rosemary pointed one finger up to the ceiling, though I guess she was really pointing up toward heaven. Apparently, she was going to get God to help her plan my party. I figured God had much, much better things to do, like keeping people from starving to death or from killing each other, or helping my papa, and so I hoped he'd just stay out of it. And I knew I wasn't the only one. I could feel Fish and Grandpa getting more and more nervous at all the talk of parties. Thirteenth birthdays at the in the Beaumont family were strictly non-public affairs. I had been only eight years old back when Rocket turned thirteen, but I still remembered it as fresh and brisk as the crisp sea air. On that years ago day, at our home down south, when Grandma Dollop was still alive and Gypsy wasn't yet, Rock and Fish had spent the entire afternoon in the backyard, helping Grandma with her canning, while Mama got the house ready for Rocket's birthday dinner. The top of the picnic table was covered in Grandma's clear glass jars, each one with its own white label and metal lid. She'd given us kids the job of labeling the jars as she filled them, but it wasn't peaches, tomatoes, or pickles that our Grandma canned. It was radio waves. Grandma only ever picked the best ones. Her favorite songs or stories or speeches, all broadcast by the local stations. But still, our basement was crowded with high shelves of dusty jars, filled with years and years of radio programs. How Grandma Dollop put the radio waves into the jars and got them to stay there was a mystery to me. She just had a way of reaching out and plucking them from the air like she was catching fireflies. Then she'd stuff the invisible things into the jars and tell us what to write on the labels. After that... All anyone had to do was crack the lid on any jar in her collection to hear what was inside. But you have to be careful not to take the lids off all the way, or the sounds and songs slipped out in a way, lost for good, unless Grandma was there and could catch them again in time. 
Sitting in the backyard that day, watching Grandma capture her radio waves, Rocket had been crankier than a bear in winter. The sun had almost set on his 13th birthday, and so far, nothing had happened. My brother was worried that nothing ever would, since Rocket w was Mama and Papa's first child, and Papa came from an ordinary, everyday family with no special talents, except that of losing all their hair before turning 30. Rocket feared that he'd take after Papa, and wind up with no savvy, and no hair on his head either. Evening fell, and the sun crept down. We had just begun to carry all the jars into the house when Rocket stopped short, still standing still as still with his arms full of that day's canned radio broadcasts. His skin looked, his skin looked pale in the early evening glow. He hunched over his armful of glass jars, staggering like someone had just thrown them all, all at him. Grandma Dollop had stopped too, her head tilted like she was listening. I felt my hair stand up on end as an electric current ran through the air with a tingling itch. That's funny, said Grandma, still listening. Something must have gone wrong with the radio station. I don't hear anything but static. You okay, Rocket? I'd asked my brother carefully, worried by the pinched look on his face and the way every muscle in his body seemed to tense and tighten. I think I'm going to be sick, said Rocket. Then, in a blinding explosion of brilliant blue sparks, like the 4th of July, without the red or the white, my brother fell to his knees. As the jars he'd been carrying crashed to the ground and shattered, they let loose the, no the noise of nine different radio shows at once, and a chorus of voices and sounds fluttered into the night air. At the same moment, every light inside and outside of the house went out. Street lamps fizzled and burst in small showers of glass, and the neighbors' homes went dark all the way down the block. A blackout rolled out from our house and didn't stop until it hit the next town over. R Rocket had gotten his savvy, and it was a shocker. Climbing into bed on the night before my very own most important birthday, after an evening of Miss Rosemary's meatloaf and interference, I did not pray for a powerful savvy like Rocket's. I did not pray for x-ray vision or the ability to run super fast or to breathe underwater. I didn't pray for Grandpa or for Gypsy. I didn't even pray for Papa to wake up. That night, I prayed that no one, no one would come to my birthday party.